As per usual, on the 24th day of the moon's orbit, when Jupiter, Saturn, Uranus, and Uranus aligned, I descended into the depths of Twitter. I like to check it every so often and see what's going on, you know. And by see what's going on, I mean navigate the ravaged landscape and check the risk of rain to Twitter to see if there are any big announcements that I missed by like four weeks. But on this day, when I checked the risk of rain to Twitter, I wasn't met with some new music from Chris or just a literal description of some random aspect of the game, which they seem to like to do a lot. No. I was met with something far more interesting, more competitive, more content worthy. I was met with the Tournament of Survivors. A tweet was sent out a couple of weeks ago as of this recording that contained news of a Risk of Rain 2 Survivor Tournament hosted on Twitter by Hobo Games, pitting every single survivor in Risk of Rain 2 head to head in a battle of popularity to find the ultimate survivor. According to Hobo Games, the tournament goes something like this. Every survivor in the game was randomly placed into the tournament bracket and pitted against another random survivor. Every week, Twitter is able to vote on a round in the bracket. They choose which of the two survivors in the given round should advance to the next round based on the criteria of which survivor they thought was the best of the two presented. After the vote, the winning survivor is advanced in the bracket, while the losing survivor is doomed to low meta status. This cycle is then continued until an ultimate winner is chosen, which is then crowned the survivor above all survivors, the mythic slayer above all mythic slayers, the some other synonym to a survivor atop all synonym to survivors, the champion. Now any normal person might think that that's great, and partake in the public voting on Twitter to choose who they think is the best survivor in each round, have fun discussions with the community, and maybe learn a thing or two about their favorite survivor in Risk of Rain 2. But Twitter. I can't be bothered to check Twitter on a weekly basis to vote, that's ludicrous. But I also want to join in on the tournament fun as well. Hmm, whatever will I do? Wait, yes, yes, it's brilliant, it's magnificent. It's the Frosis official Tournament of Survivors 2.0 trademark patent copyright. That's right, when the going gets tough, the tough make their own tournaments, and that's exactly what I'm doing. This bracket will not merely be a superficial vote on which survivor looks cooler. No you will receive a bona fide expert opinion on each round, in which I will give my full analysis on each and every choice I make of who I move forward in the tournament. And you also get a complimentary mint. Warning, watching this video does not in fact grant the viewer a free physical peppermint. However, you are fully unable to imagine having a peppermint at your discretion. So join me, my fellow Risk of Rain tours, as I embark on my own totally awesome, really cool, the Frost's official Tournament of Survivors 2.0 trademark patent copyright, which is like 145% better than Hopo Games 1. Alright, so before we start the brackets, a couple things. I am going to borrow the starting bracket from the Hobo Games Tournament because it looks pretty well enough randomized and I'm, uh, selectively hardworking, but I can assure you that the rest of this bracket will be completely and totally from my own little old brain. And speaking of my own little old brain, I'm going to set a quick preface. All of this video is coming from my brain. That means that everything spoken here will be an opinion, an opinion that you may or may not share with me, which is fine. This is not a dead set list of the undisputed best survivor in the game that you have to agree with, it's just my thoughts. I'm going to attempt to justify my decisions on why I move certain survivors up in the tournaments, but in essence, I am ranking these survivors based on which one I like more, which is of course a very personal thing. And also, since this is such a big bracket and I have a tendency to ramble, I'm going to be keeping the rounds moving so that the video isn't like an hour long. That means that I may very well skip out on some of the more complicated aspects of survivors, like specific stats and text and item combos and stuff, in favor of a more general view of survivors. So basically, take this whole video with a barrel of salt and know that I might leave some stuff out or forget some stuff. And with that out of the way, onto the brackets. First up in the Frosis official tournament of survivors 2.0 trademark patent copyrights, we have Accurate vs. Loader. Melee Robot vs. Sword of Melee Void Dog, who will be the melee est with a hint of range. Est. Well, Acra definitely has a pretty compelling moveset here, what with him having both melee and projectile attacks, which means he can cover both melee and range options. He can swipe close enemies with his primary, shoot distance enemies with his secondary and special, and leap to enemies with his utility, basically rounding out close, mid, and far range attacks. And his attacks on top of range also have some damage. Acra has the highest base damage stat in the game behind Heretic which while that isn't really huge in the grand scheme of things, it helps in the early game and is generally beneficial with scaling damage. Along with that, his signature poison and blight abilities are also very good damage passives. Adding that onto the pretty good damage of his other abilities plus the extra procs, Acre can definitely hold his own in the damage department. Acre also has some pretty decent mobility with his utility, which can also negate fall damage, which is pretty fun to mess around with. All around, not too shabby. On the other side of the ring, Loader does not have as much range as Acrid, but boy does she excel at melee damage. 
I mean, the lady is literally a tank on legs. As with her high base health and scrap area passive, she can tank like almost anything. Except collapse, but screw collapse. She also really excels at movement, as she takes no fall damage and can practically cross the entire map stage 1 with no items with their grappling gauntlet. Motor is, in my opinion, one of the easiest characters to move across distances with, at least in the early game, as she can travel laughably far in any direction with her grappling gauntlets, like map crossing territory, far surpassing that of Akrid's movement capabilities. And added on to that, her movement abilities also deal damage too, do for one deal. Loader does some crazy melee damage with her punch and especially her gauntlet, and while she doesn't have much range, she can very quickly cover distance to enemies to use her melee attacks, and her spiked grapple and M551 pylon can provide some decent lighter range damage, making her not entirely just dependent on melee, although Akrid does beat her in terms of range damage options. However still, Loader just does such a killer job in the movement and damage departments, making up for her lack of range with her mobility and the high DPS on her attacks in comparison to Akrid. So, I'm giving this round to Loader. Next up is Artificer vs Mercenary. Now I'm a little biased with Mercenary, as I know I said I wouldn't bring up techs and stuff, but just this once, when I learned how to do the tech where you essentially have zero cooldowns with Merc, I kinda mained him for a bit which lacked a lasting memory. But, to be fair, Merc definitely has a reason to be liked. As one of the relatively higher skill ceiling survivors, what with his like I don't even know how many techs, he's a fun survivor to play for some extra engagement if you're into that. He's not like super or overly complicated or anything, but he's a bit more complex with his techs than other survivors, which is fun for the challenge and change of pace from press button go shoot. He's also just fun to play to me, as his melee only attacks pair very well with his movement based moveset. Zipping around and slashing and hacking enemies is pretty satisfying to do, and seeing as both his utility and special, his eviscerate special to be specific, give iframes, you can be quite aggressive with enemies and not face too many consequences while dishing out some good damage numbers. My only big downside for him is that he is limited to just melee, as Slicing Winds is the only projectile attack he has, and he isn't quite as movement optimized as Loader, who is also very limited to melee, which sometimes makes snapping enemies from far away or escaping a sticky situation a pain. But his iframe abilities are pretty useful in that department, so it's not all that bad. Overall, Merc is a solid choice, with considerable movement capabilities and damage to match, along with techs and iframes that promote some fun aggression in-game. Moving over to Artificer, she is kinda opposite to Mercenary, actually. Rather than doing up close rapid fire damage, Artificer excels at burst damage from a distance. She has some of the longer cooldowns in the game, but she also has some of the biggest damage numbers too, as her Nanobomb Bomb and Spear, Snap Freeze, Flamethrower, and Ion Surge all deal some very good numbers percentage wise. She doesn't really have much horizontal movement capability, but she makes up for it with her Ion Surge and Hover Passive, which cover the very rare case of being able to escape combat vertically which can be more situationally advantageous in some occasions against fleeing horizontally. This combo also enables her to float from above and safely dish out damage to enemies below, as the range on most of her abilities is very far. In comparing these two survivors, they couldn't be more different, so it was a pretty hard choice to decide who moves on, but I ended up going at Mercenary. I just feel like he is more fun and consistently viable, specifically because of his playstyle and movesets. Sure, Artificer can deal larger numbers and float around anywhere she wants, but she has those massive cooldowns that can get pretty annoying in a pinch, especially if you miss an attack since you're often so high up in the air. And also, her burst nature kind of makes stuff proccing a bit rare. On the contrary, Merc's whole moveset is movement related, and he can definitely dish out fast and consistent damage by comparison, along with having more proc potential. So, while he is limited to basically melee only, Merc's kit does a great job in making that viable. So, this round's gonna have to go to good old Merc. And up next is Bandit vs Multi. The Robo Duo, both these survivors have some neat stuff in their Robo Corners. Starting with Multi, if Loader was a tank on wheels, Multi is a barging tank on wheels. As one of the few survivors to start with armor and the survivor with the highest base health, Multi is a unit, and a unit that doesn't just have high health. Multi's Nail Gun, Buzzsaw, Rebar, and Missiles all deal pretty great numbers, especially Nail Gun, which has the highest base attack speed of any primary in the game and can literally get so fast with power mode that you can fly by shooting down. Along with that, his other special retool allows him to hold two separate primaries at once, which adds to his versatility, as you can pair the short range nail gun with the long range rebar, or missiles with buzzsaw, or some other combo. However, as he is a unit, he is also pretty slow, and his only movement ability, his utility, is just kinda okay-ish in terms of movements. He can kinda get you stuck when you need a quick getaway and just end up bouncing back off a random stone titan after using your utility. 
but he has enough health and DPS to often be a, well, unit and survive. However, on the other hand, we have Bandit, who is a decent bit faster than old Multi. Bandit is a western movie cool survivor with a pretty cool gimmick. All of his hits done on the back of an enemy are guaranteed to crit. A decent bit of his moveset is built off of this premise, and it definitely gives Bandit potential to get some big numbers without needing to worry about crit rates. As for his moveset, his primary, a shotgun, isn't really anything huge, but it does decent damage with the crit bonus and is alright for most occasions. His rifle blast is just kinda bad though, as his projectiles don't have any drop and the damage of the rifle compared to the shotgun is pretty noticeable, so you're just kinda stuck with the shotgun. His dagger and shift secondaries are also kinda mediocre. They cause hemorrhaging, do some okay damage, but again are nothing huge to me personally. Bandit's real self, however, shines with his smoke bomb utility and lights out on Desperado specials. He has the ability to go invisible and sneak behind enemies, and has big hitter specials that can play off his guaranteed crit for some pretty massive damage, especially in the case of Desperado, although I personally find it more fun to chain hits with lights out myself. But however fun lights out is, a decision needs to be made, and I'm going with Multi. I just don't really like Bandit too much. He feels a little underwhelming compared to Multi, as his damage output, even with his crit, is minimal compared to Multi's boss melting primaries right off the start of the game. While Bandit does have more movement capability than Multi, I think it's just easier to get good runs with Multi, and to me, Multi is just more fun to play, especially with those double mini guns. So, this round goes to Multi. Up next is Captain and Rex. Another robotic ish pair, again. These two also have some neat stuff in their robo corners. Starting with Rex, Rex is a bit of a stressful survivor, as the one thing you will never get with it is a consistent health level, but it also definitely has the capability to stay alive. Rex has the interesting gimmick of trading health for damage, as several of its abilities, its Mortar Secondary, Bramble Utility, and Tangle Growth Special, take away health from Rex. You'd think that would be a downside, but luckily, Rex also has several abilities that heal him, including his primary, Bramble, and both of his specials, which if used correctly can heal for a percentage higher than the health they take, except his primary, which does no self-damage. This culminates into a tight game of using attacks that drain and restore health and managing that health as you play, being careful to not lose too much health but also to deal enough damage to take enemies out. It's a fun, unique, risk-reward playstyle, and while it's a little odd and also lacks much mobility, it's still one that is viable and can lead to some good runs pretty often due to Rex's inability to actually die in many cases. On the more standard-ish side, we have Captain. Pulling from the power of the USC safe travels, Captain can become any world leader with the press of a big red button, notably with his orbital probes, beacons, and a- as for his other abilities, his primary is a massive shotgun that I've heard with the tech can be spammed making it very very good, but I cannot for the life of me get it right and I don't know if it's been patched, but regardless, it's still a solid primary with really good damage, almost 1000% if all 8 pellets hit. His secondary, however, is honestly kinda meh. It stuns an enemy it hits, makes a little 2 meter AoE of shock, and can bounce, and that's about it. It has some tactical advantage, but it's kinda oddly underwhelming compared to his other abilities. Speaking of those, Captain's utilities are the Orbital Probe and Diablo Strike, and these are a large chunk of his damage overall. One is a pretty good 3 hit aerial strike with some high percent damage, and the other is just a really, really funny meme. It's hard to consistently make Diablo work because of its long deploy period, but it's still fun to use regardless and basically kills anything it hits. His beacons, however, are probably what Captain is most known for. He can take two into each stage and drop them at will, and they do a variety of useful things, from shocking enemies, to healing, to loot goblining, to recharging equipment. They are super useful in a lot of scenarios, and you can take any combo of two you want, but I do kind of find it annoying that he can only drop two total per stage. Now I know that's for balancing and there's ways to circumvent that to an extent, but I just find it underwhelming that he can only drop two total per stage as they have a small AoE and I often find myself waiting for the right moment to use them, only to keep waiting because I only have two so I basically just wait for the boss then use it there. Along with that, Captain has literally zero mobility in his movesets. So, although Captain's abilities have some hit to them and his nuke is stupid fun, I'm giving this round to Rex because to me, his kit is just better suited to get going and runs consistently, and his playstyle feels more unique and fun to me. And next up, we have Commando vs. Engineer. Engineer is one of those survivors I love to play when I just want to turn my brain off. I drop in, place a few turrets, shoot a few missiles, and play some landmines, and that's about it. His playstyle is definitely one of the more hands-off ones, but he can still deal considerably high damage. Following his hands-off nature, his primary is rarely if ever touched by me, and it's honestly kinda meh. 
It's a chargeable shot of bombs that are hard to aim, easy to miss, have small range, and deal okay-ish damage. The real engineer kit lies in his other abilities. His secondary mines provide substantial damage, and his ult mines can walk to enemies, meaning you can just kinda throw them out and watch them go. As for his utilities, his shield bubble is a full shield that blocks all incoming shots but can be shot out of, which is pretty good for defense of you and your turrets. His homing missiles though, oh boy, they are super fun. As I said before, Inji is a pretty hands-off character, so his missiles are a nice way to somewhat engage without too much effort, and they deal pretty good damage at a very decent range with homing to take out any pesky enemies your turrets may miss. But of course, Inji's highlights are his turrets. They are, as I'm sure you already know, kinda busted. It's basically like having two extra survivors at your disposal, ones that take aggro, deal damage as hard as you do, and can be replaced when destroyed. And of course, Bungus. However, with all that positive stuff said, Engineer is one of those survivors who sacrifices movement for his strong abilities, as he has literally no movement in his kit at all, so he kinda has to set up shop somewhere and stay there, especially with the stationary turrets, which in my opinion are much better than his moving ones. But still, a strong survivor. But is he as strong as Commando? Well, on the opposite side of the coin, we have Commando. Commando is much more hands-on and much more mobile. A kinda jack of all trades, Commando doesn't really have any obvious strengths or weaknesses, and that comes with advantages and disadvantages. His primary is a decent double pistol shot that, while it is kinda underwhelming in terms of damage, it has a lot of proc potential because of its higher attack rate. His secondaries are pretty standard as well. One is a piercing bullet and the other is a shotgun blast. And while both deal pretty good numbers, especially his phase shotgun blast, they are within average in terms of scope and abilities in the game. His utility is pretty nice, specifically his ult, which is a long distance slide that also cancels air momentum if used in the air, which can save you from taking fall damage. And finally, his specials are a succession of shots that stun enemies, or really, really hard to control grenades that are stupid on console. It may seem like I kinda sped by his abilities, but Commando really is just kinda standard. He's designed for new players, so he's designed to not be too complicated so you don't get overwhelmed with trying to figure out a new survivor while also learning about the tons of material and info in the overall game. With that said, that kinda inherently makes him a little stale and not super unique. He's not terrible, but he's just built average, not a super unique survivor. Compared to Engineer, he just seems so standard, and that weighs my decision a lot. Also, personally, I think Engineer definitely eclipses him in terms of viability, as his kit just packs so much damage and is so consistent in runs. But even if Engineer didn't do that well, he at least has some unique substance to him. So, this round's gonna have to go to Engineer. And next up is Huntress vs... Ah. Okay, I'm giving Huntress a default here. I know Heretic is a survivor, but Heretic isn't a base survivor, and I don't feel like trying to balance her with normal survivors in a fair way, so I'm just gonna... Yeah, go Huntress. Lightning round. And finally, to end the first round, we have Void Fiend vs. Railgunner. The two newcomers to Risk of Rain 2, which of the two Voiders will be crowned the victor? Who will stand the test of my mighty judgment? Who will know why I am suddenly asking rhetorical questions in an announcer fashion? We'll just have to see. Starting with Railgunner, what we basically have here is Loader's DPS in a bullet. Railgunner is a very, very heavy hitter, and I mean heavy. Her abilities have some of the highest percent damage in the entire game, and aptly so, considering she's basically Sniper from Risk of Rain 1. Her primary is a barrage of helming missiles that deal pretty solid damage and are good for proccing. However, their measly 100% damage shadows in comparison to her secondary. With it, she can change her gun into a giant railgun that can shoot either 1000% piercing bullets with a damage increasing manual reload in between each shot, or multiple 400% damage shots that don't require reloading manually. And added onto that, shooting the weak point of an enemy crits for even more damage. Both secondaries deal pretty high damage with a lower fire rate, especially in the case of the first one, but their low fire rate is wholly justified in their insane DPS potential. I mean, you one-shot so many enemies with the 1000% secondary, especially in early game, and you can quickly eliminate most enemies in a few shots with the 400% secondary. As for her utility, it's a placeable mine that can be used to propel yourself decently far with an alright cooldown, which is great to reposition yourself for a new sniping angle, although it's nothing huge in terms of movements. Her other utility is another mine that instead slows enemies in a bubble, which is nice for making hitting weak points easier, but it has no propulsion, so it's a trade-off. But, oh boy, is the real highlight to Railgunner her specials. Her specials range from a 4000% massive piercing shot to a 2000% freezing piercing shot. 
both of which just melts everything. Void Fiend is gonna have to really prove their worth to top that, but they just might be able to. Void Fiend, the commando who had one too many bustling fungus mushrooms, is undoubtedly one of the most unique survivors in the entire game. Instead of having abilities and alternate abilities, it fluctuates between two separate forms, Control and Corrupted, which each possess their own entirely separate abilities. This fluctuation is metered by its corruption meter, which increases with damage and passively over time, and decreases with health regeneration. At any value below 100%, Fiend stays in its controlled form with its controlled abilities. However, when the meter reaches 100% corruption, Fiend switches to its corrupt form with its corrupted abilities. At this point, the meter starts counting down passively over time and with healing and goes up with damage taken, and when the meter reaches zero, or in the case of you have void items, when it reaches whatever percent is the equivalent of zero, you return to your controlled form and the meter starts counting up again. As for its two forms, its controlled form is less aggressive and more, well, controlled. Its primary can consistently take care of enemies at any range, its secondary is a strong bolt projectile that can be charged up to become a mini spirit bomb, its utility cleanses all debuffs and propels you in the air, and its special heals you for 25% max HP at the cost of 25% corruption. It's a pretty dang decent moveset, that while it may lack somewhat in damage, it covers a lot of ranges in terms of offensive and defensive capability and movement and has a built-in immediate heal. Fiend's corrupted form, however, is way way more aggressive. Its primary becomes a small Kamehameha beam, its secondary becomes an instantly shot spirit bomb, its utility becomes a forward teleport, and its special increases its corrupted state at the cost of 25% of its max HP. This form is way more offensively capable, at the cost of tending to drain Fiend's health more than its controlled form because it loses its healing special and it has to be up close to enemies due to its close range primary, which is like its main source of damage while in corrupted form. However, the neat thing about Fiend is that you can switch between these two forms, and the fault in one form is often covered up by the other. The lack of damage in Fiend's controlled form is made up in its corrupted form, the lack of healing in its corrupted form is made up in its controlled form, the lack of horizontal mobility in its controlled form is made up in its corrupted form, etc etc. The coexistence of these two forms, and properly using them, is what really makes Void Fiend stand out to me, in a way that no other survivor does. While yes, it can access the advantages of its two forms entirely at will, as the switch isn't something you can just turn on and off, you can still influence the switch in its form from either intentionally taking damage or healing with its controlled special or other means. And the form switch happens often enough that you can situationally use both forms when needed. Fiend overall covers a lot of bases when it comes to good traits in a survivor, because it's kinda like two survivors smushed into one, and it's definitely a pretty good competitor to Railgunner, but who do we move on? Well, in a hard choice, I'm going to give this round to Void Fiend. Fiend is just a really well-rounded and really unique survivor. I mean, it has a built-in heal, it has basically 8 abilities in its kit that are usable at once, and its DPS, defense, and movement are all surprisingly equally very good, which is kinda rare to see in a singular survivor. Railgunner definitely can outclass Fiend in single target DPS, but Fiend just has so many bases covered in its kit that I have to give this round to it, albeit in a tough decision. Alright, and that wraps up round one of the tournament. Sinoli, uh, yeah, that, wow, that was a really long time. I, I, I do ramble. Don't worry, though. Now that I've run through the descriptions and my thoughts on all of the survivors, these next rounds should go a lot more smoothly. In the first fight of round two, we have Loader vs. Mercenary. The malicious melee duo, these two are heavy hitters at a close range, but only one can move on. As I stated before in round 1, both excel in terms of DPS and movement capability, making up for their lack of projectiles with multiple melee options that can cover a variety of ranges. However, that said, Loader in my opinion does a better job at being a good melee character compared to Mercenary. Loader can cross like almost the entire map stage 1 no items, and almost all of her kit has propulsion, which can enable her to easily close gaps to faraway enemies. Along with that, her pylon can reach pesky enemies like whiffs that may evade her grasp, and on top of that, her DPS is absurd. I mean, absurd compared to Mercenary, which more than makes up for the lack of range. On the contrary, while Mercenary can certainly reach enemies at a distance and definitely has range capability along with those sweet, sweet iframes, I just feel like Loader has an advantage in terms of both DPS and movement over Mercenary overall. She also is, in my opinion, just more fun to play, what with her crazy movement and unga bunga number damage, and so she will be moving on to the next round. And second up on round 2, we have Multi and Rex, the robot versus the plant robot. Now I will admit, this round is a bit more biased than others because of the, uh, 
fun I've been having with my recent-ish unlock of Multi's Power Mode, but of course I'll try my best to be fair. Rex has some very good DPS potential, considering its DPS is high because it sacrifices its health for DPS. And as I said before, it has a lot of healing potential, meaning that while you may hit critical health more than what is usually comfortable, Rex players can usually get out of binds with HP via their high damage massacring enemies and use of multiple healing abilities also keeping them alive. However, Multi is certainly no rookie to DPS either, as its DPS potential is also massive, especially with combos like Double Nail Gun Power Mode. Multi also has the advantage of tons of variants, as its 4 primaries and retool and power mode specials lead to a ton of potential primary combos that can be made, adding some unique choice to Multi's kit on a run by run basis. Multi also has some alright movement with its utility, something that Rex lacks, and Multi's high armor lets it withstand hits even without the healing Rex has at a more consistent, predictable rate, leading to a generally more consistent survivor. So, I'm going to give this round to Multi. And next up is Engineer vs Huntress. These two are kinda worlds apart in terms of playstyle, but nevertheless they must go head to head. Engineer is, of course, just a wonder to behold. A consistent survivor that seems to always get a decent run. His turrets are just such a good addition to Engineer, as they inherit all items and are replaceable, which often leads to a two-way copy of Engineer which late game can get a little crazy. And the turrets are only his special ability, his homing missiles, shield bubble, and mines can also help him progress through stages while he builds items for his turrets, ensuring capable defensive and offensive moves even when his turrets are lacking in DPS initially. Now, Puntress of course is on a whole nother bandwagon, with a much more direct approach to enemies. Her primary fire can auto-aim at a mid-ish range, ensuring that every shot counts, even if it's not the enemy you may have wanted to hit. Her boomerang secondary is a great way to get rid of hordes of smaller enemies, and with some magazines it can turn into a DPS monster. Her utility is a special joy as well, as her blink gives her both a lot of movement capability and iframes, which are great for making an escape or just generally for moving around. And her specials are both pretty decent damage dealers, though her ballista is definitely the shining one, as its 900% per bolt do pretty well at taking down any foe. Huntress has a huge advantage on Engineer in terms of movement, and she also has the upper hand in direct controllable damage instead of relying on a secondary, or specialary, I guess, source as Engineer does. However, with that said, Engineer has a ridiculous amount of potential from Stage 1, and can very quickly stack DPS in a pretty consistent manner with his turrets, especially considering he can hold up to 3 with the new Void item. Sure, Engineer isn't very direct and he may not move very well, but once he sets up a base, he can dish out some huge damage to any enemy that approaches, something Huntress can't quite pull off as well. Engineer also has more survivability than Huntress with his higher base health, something that Huntress notably struggles in. Overall, while Huntress was a great contender, Engineer takes the win in my book for his consistent and high DPS mixed with loads of ability options that ensure damage and defensive capability even in the early game. So, NG moves on. As for the next round, following the not at all as good Hobo Games Tournament of Survivors, I'm going to give Void Fiend a buy since that's just how the brackets line up, so just pretend that I made a very well thought out and intensive speech about Void Fiend that gave him a win and a move up. And now it comes down to the final four. Now, from here on out, I will warn you that results will probably be way more opinionated than before because I'm getting to some of the harder choices that ultimately come down at least partially to personal preference of which one I just like more. Like, I can explain all I want, but at a certain point, I just, you know, like a survivor more than the other for a culmination of reasons that I may not best list out due to time, so be warned. Anyway, first up, we have Loader vs. Multi, the robot kinda robot duo who will make it to the finals. Well, this again is a situation of vastly different survivors. Loader is a melee specialist, while Multi is a bit more flexible but mainly ranged. This battle really came down to me looking at the strengths and weaknesses of both in their respective classes and seeing who has more value per se. And value is not the best word here since they both have value, but more so who of the two brings more umph to the table, I guess is what I mean. I warned you this would not be the most sound decision. Loader obviously has the full advantage in terms of melee, as while Multi has double buzzsaw power mode potential, Loader was designed with melee as a main damage source, with her scrap metal passive, immunity to fall damage, and multiple melee attacks in her arsenal. She also prevails big time in movement, easily outclassing what Multi can do with her grapple and gauntlet boost. Multi on the other hand, definitely has the edge on Loader in terms of variety, as Multi can be basically whatever survivor you want. Range only? Double rebar. Range and close-up damage? Rebar and Missile or Nail Gun and Buzzsaw. Only melee? Double Buzzsaw. Multi can cover a lot of bases in terms of being valuable, and this also leads to Multi being more fun in his variedness. 
Multi also has some big DPS potential to match Loader, as while Multi's damage is not always big single hits like Loader, it still has some insane DPS potential with its kit, especially realized in its power mode. And of course, Multi has a leg up on range over Loader. So really, both of these survivors have their own special areas that they excel in, and as a result, they have different reasons to like them, which is, like, how they were designed to be different. But a choice must be made, and personally, I am moving on Loader to the final round. I really, really like Multi, and especially Dual Nail Gun Power Mode, but I just personally have more consistent, fun, and good runs with Loader. Swinging around the map, dealing outrageous damage stage 1, not even caring about dying early game, all these factors and my inclinement to like melee all just make me want to go with Loader. Sure, multi outclasses Loader in variety, range, and they can match in DPS with certain items, but Loader just has a mastery of movement, a key piece of Risk of Rain 2, and her kit is so well designed for her melee aspect, as her scrap area and immunity to fall damage perfectly complement her melee nature and massive movement potential. This culminates into a unit that is perfectly optimized, dealing great damage and having insane movement to boot. She just works, and works so well. So in a tough choice, I choose Loader to move on to the final round. And in the final round, before the final round, we have Engineer vs Void Fiend. Now this again is a battle of very different skill sets. We have sit back, relax and win, and get intense and win. But I'm just going to be using the same thought process as I did on the last round. Fiend is an incredibly remarkable survivor because of its huge variety. If you thought Multi had variety, Fiend has it doubled. Literally, he has access to his alternate abilities while using his standard ones. He has range in his controlled primary, big short range DPS in his corrupted primary, both secondaries have range, his controlled utility has upward movement, his corrupted utility has forward movement, and his controlled special heals him and his corrupted special lets him control his state to a degree. Fiend just kinda does everything. His DPS is good, his defense is good with the debuff removal of his utility, his range options are good, and his movement is alright as well. He even has a built-in immediate heal, covering ground even Rex hasn't touched. Fiend is just very well-rounded, and very fun to play with his state-switching capability. However, how does that compare to a survivor who specializes, but specializes very, very well? Well, Engineer does just that. He can't move, he has no built-in heal, and he's limited to 4 abilities in-game, but man can NG deal some serious damage and do it consistently. His turrets, with their item inheriting ability, basically create 2 or even 3 with the void fuel cell item, copies of him. Copies that can deal survival level damage, heal ridiculously fast with Bungus, and are replaceable. His homing missiles can easily cover pesky enemies his turrets miss and help out early game. His bubble shield is great for defense, and his mines provide a decent extra damage source if that's even needed, which you may often find it isn't, especially late game. With NG, you can literally disconnect your brain once you set up shop somewhere, and just marvel at the damage numbers and the safety of your Bungus turrets. NG doesn't have huge variety, sure, but the things he specializes in, he specializes in well. So this became a test of which is better, variety or speciality. After playing with both, I realized that this question is pretty much entirely subjective. Both are able to provide consistent fun gameplay in their own unique ways, ways that are hard to compare because of their contrasting nature. It all came down to just which style do you think is better, and in my opinion, I went with... Engineer. I know, Fiend has a built-in heal, massive damage, covers all the bases of things a survivor needs, and yet I just feel myself gravitating towards Engineer. I just like his style of play more, a consistent game that regardless of my items just seems to go well, because of the absurd DPS of his turrets and strength of his other abilities. I will admit that perhaps it does get a little boring with Engineer because of his kinda more hands-off approach compared to Fiend, especially late game, but it's still fun to play NG to me, managing his turrets while taking out enemies with homing missiles and covering me and my turrets with mines. Sure, it's turn your brain off this and straightforward, but hey, it's fun, it works well, and along with my personal preference for NG's dominance in a specialized area, I'm convinced to move NG to the final round. Well, people of the virtual crowd, We've done it. After a long, long drawn out battle of words, we've reached the end. Many a survivor have contested, but many a survivor have, ironically, not survived. It all comes down to two final survivors. Two cream of the crop, two survivor of the survivors, Loader and Engineer. Now, I have extensively gone over both of their attributes, strengths, weaknesses, and the likes, so at this point you most likely know my stance on both of them, and you also probably know this choice is the most opinionated of the entire bracket. 
as this is just basically me saying which of these two survivors, which I provided extensive reason for liking, do I like more. Engineer's insane DPS potential, broad arsenal, and incredible specialization make him an impeccable all-around survivor. While his playstyle may be different than a lot of the cast of the game, he's a survivor that just survives well, able to consistently pull clears and loops like it's nothing. And then we have Loader, who is the epitome of movement, an optimized kit, and survivability. She can take stage 1 bosses with no items on Monsoon, she can cross the map with no artificial boosts in movement, her kit perfectly pairs her damage and movement to complement each other, and she can dang well survive. She seems to always deliver a good run, and is just hard to kill, as her scrap barrier and high base health give her the sturdiness of a tank, while her incredible close-up DPS can take care of anything that stands in her way. So, I am obviously pretty conflicted on which of these two survivors is better, because, in reality, it's hard to really define if a survivor is better. I know that's like the whole point of the video, but I do want to elaborate a bit that there is no survivor that everyone should play because X, Y, and Z. Ultimately, it comes down to your personal choice, and all the data in the game can't convince otherwise. Opinions are opinions after all. And so, in my opinionated statement, I am giving the title of the Frosis Official Tournament of Survivors 2.0 Trademark Patent Copyright Champion to Loader. I dabbled in Risk of Rain 1 before playing Risk of Rain 2, because that's how numbers work, I think. Anyway, Loader is in both Risk of Rain 1 and 2, and honestly, in Risk of Rain 1, I wasn't the big fan of her. Er, him, because Loader is a guy in Risk of Rain 1, but is a girl in Risk of Rain 2, so... Um, anyway, point is, I didn't like Loader that much in Risk of Rain 1 compared to that cast of survivors. However, in Risk of Rain 2, Loader's playstyle just fits right smack in. Risk of Rain 2 introduced the third dimension compared to 1, and with that, a heavy emphasis on movement. Any Risk of Rain 2 player knows that slow kills, for several reasons. Finding the teleporter takes longer, which makes the difficulty increasing clock drag on longer. Dodging enemies gets harder, getting to certain areas is hard or impossible, and generally, it's just a struggle to work with slow movement due to the large and dense sizes of the maps. That is why Risk of Rain 2 Loader is such a good survivor to me. She's built for 3D. You can swing all around the map, getting to places high, low, or far away, and do so in a way that's fun because of that open movement opportunity that comes with 3D. And of course, added onto that, this movement kit transitions superbly into offensive play. Loader's lack of range is accounted for by her hard-hitting abilities, and that lack of range is also made up in her ability to move, basically giving her a double positive. The game grants you some insane damage percent stats on abilities because you have no range unlike every other survivor in the game, but you can also artificially have range because of her insane movements. It's just a win-win. And along with it giving her an edge in damage, my gosh does Loader's emphasis on movement just feel so fun to play. Swinging around, gauntlet punching through enemies, it's just so nice to do because it just fits right in with the open 3D space of the game. This is honestly my primary reason for picking Loader. I just personally enjoy her not giving a hoot about fall damage, swinging around, and punching stuff playstyle. It's just so satisfying on like a primal level. I mean, she does have a reason for being so good. Her kit builds off her ability to move, granting her great DPS and range options with great movements. And she has super high health with her base stat and scrap barrier passive, culminating in a destructive mobile tank. However, again, it's just that swinging, moving playstyle that really gets me, and just makes me love Loader. So, Loader, congrats. You are officially crowned queen of the Frosis official Tournament of Survivors 2.0 trademark patent copyright. Risk of Rain 1 Loader, sorry, but maybe next time. Good goodness, this has been a lot of video. But we finally made it through and deemed an official the Frosis official Tournament of Survivors 2.0 trademark patent copyright champion. Of course, as I stated before, this entire tournament is in no way the decider for who you should play in Risk of Rain 2. That's up to you. I think there really is no truly, objectively better survivor in Risk of Rain 2. It all comes down to just which one do you like more. Sure, some survivors have weaknesses that others may not have, but ultimately, personal choice is the determinant. And I personally just think Loader has so many strengths combined with my personal liking for her that I'm giving her the spot. But, what do you think? What would the Frosis official Tournament of Survivors 2.0 trademark patent copyright look like if you were in charge? Who would your champion be? And what do you think of my own brackets? Please let me know in the comments. And my voice is already dead from like 30 minutes of recording, so I don't have it in me to make some joke for the end right now, so uh, future editing me, insert some random joke or something for the end.
yeah, that's uh, that's that's probably funny. That's that's probably it's probably pretty good. I I, tr I trust myself. See you in the next video. Goodbye.